Metroidvania is a portmanteau of the game titles Metroid and Castlevania, and is often considered a subgenre of 2D action games in which the mechanics and level design encourage exploration rather than just simple dashing and slashing. This genre was, of course, popularized by its namesakes, Super Metroid and Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Then the torch was carried on by passionate indie developers until today when several new Metroidvania games get released and dozens get announced on a monthly basis. With over a thousand games having the Metroidvania tag on Steam alone, not to mention the ones available on the Nintendo Switch or Sony and Microsoft's platforms, one of the most common questions asked on the R Metroidvania subreddit is, where the heck do I start? In response to this, the mods of the R Metroidvania subreddit posted a survey asking the community what games they would recommend the most as an entry point. We've compiled the votes and threw out a few games that weren't actually Metroidvania, and this list is the result of that discussion. We also left out entries from the Metroid and Castlevania series because frankly if we included them, this list would basically end up being our top 10 Metroid and Castlevania games. Which if we're being completely real, that would make a great list all on its own as an opinion piece, but it wouldn't really be that informative for anyone looking for something new to try. Also, because this list belongs to members of the R Metroidvania community, we've organized several voices from the R Metroidvania Discord to join in and present these games. I'll be giving some shoutouts to who these people are at the end of the video and in the video description. Every one of them is an awesome pillar of this community. The name of the person speaking will be displayed on the bottom right corner of the screen at the start of each game section, just like you see with my name right now. So without further ado, I present to you the R Metroidvania community's Top 10 Starter Metroidvania Games. Unequivocally the crown jewel of the independent Metroidvania niche, Hollow Knight is arguably the most well-known and beloved Metroidvania outside of the parent franchises. The world in Hollow Knight is staggeringly large, especially for its price point. It will easily see you use upwards of 30 hours on a regular playthrough. The game excels because of its complete and utter dedication to its thematic setting, with interesting lore scattered throughout the world primarily by means of environmental storytelling. This is strengthened by the game's strong artistic direction and beautiful detailed graphics. Hollow Knight is also a challenging game. If you die, you lose your currency and leave behind a ghost that must be defeated in order to get your money back. If you die before managing to do this, your money will disappear. Another challenge is the fact that the map isn't updated as you explore, but requires you to find a map maker in each main area. After that, the map only updates once you rest at a checkpoint. Additionally, there are a great number of challenging bosses that will test your metal, and you must pay careful attention to spacing and telegraphs to prevail. With upgrades aplenty and a highly non-linear map, Hollow Knight is a deep and engaging experience. The two Ori games are often regarded as the most AAA Metroidvanias available. Featuring gorgeous handcrafted graphics and dynamic environments, Ori creates a world that becomes easy to immerse yourself in. Ori is far more than just its atmosphere, however, as it sports some of the most critically acclaimed platforming in the genre. Its most unique core mechanic is the Bash ability, which lets you grab projectiles and enemies out of the air and use them for a burst of momentum. This turns levels into a physics puzzle with your goal being figuring out how to traverse treacherous terrain. The nuances in Ori's platforming mechanics give you a sense of power that only increases throughout the game. In the original game, you even had the ability to place your own checkpoints, which could lead to some shenanigans if you place them improperly, but it's a system that allows you to create your own strategy for your own approach. One of the more controversial aspects of Ori are its chase scenes, which require you to complete a long platforming challenge without dying. These function as the bosses of the game, as there are no traditional boss fights to be found. Ori in the Blind Forest is especially recommended for players who don't care for combat because its emphasis is on platforming, although the combat it does have is the most criticized portion of the game. Ori and the Will of the Wisps, on the other hand, improves the combat in significant ways, but it has a greater focus on combat as a result. Both of them are great games and we recommend playing them in order to get the most out of the story. Ori really is beautiful and delightful. Bloodstained Ritual of the Night For those who aren't familiar, this game is the brainchild of Koji Igarashi. Who is Koji Igarashi? He is the man who assisted with making what Castlevania turned into, starting with Symphony of the Night, and later produced all the Igivanias that followed. 
Bloodstained Ritual 9 is basically Castlevania in every way except name. If you've ever played Castlevania Aria of Sorrow, or its sequel Dawn of Sorrow, Ritual of the Night takes a lot of the same systems and expands them, creating one of the most complex RPG systems you can find in any Metroidvania title. Every enemy has a chance of dropping some ability, whether it's a passive boost to your stats, an offensive spell, a floating companion, or even sometimes the ability to transform into that enemy. If you play just using what you find, this can create an almost infinitely replayable experience with just the base game as is. There is also a huge variety of monsters to take down, ranging from the usual suspects found in an Egovania, to references to other games, and to the just plain weird. Koji Igarashi claimed that this was his largest castle he's made yet, and that was no lie. There are hundreds of rooms to explore and complete, and if that wasn't enough, there are two additional characters you can play as and even a randomizer mode to make each playthrough more unique. On top of the replayability of the game, there is also a replayability of the music. This beautiful soundtrack is mainly composed by Michiru Yamani, who has worked on almost every Egovania OST to some extent, with Symphony of the Night being her first entrance into the series. The bosses in combat aren't as strong as previous Egovania games, but the huge variety can make up for that. If you haven't tried Bloodstained Ritual of the Night, please do. It's emblematic of the Castlevania Metroidvania experience. Besides Nancy Drew, of course. Priestess Kahu arrives at the cursed land, equipped with only a maple leaf, tie highs, and a bow to defend herself with. Don't be fooled by the unusual choice of weapon, however, as its quick and flexible movements and ability to stun lock enemies makes it feel as powerful as any sword. Your bow can be charged up to fire several arrows at once, dealing massive damage to a single target, and best of all it can be charged while you're comboing enemies with your maple leaf. You're also given a dodge roll that provides useful invincibility frames, but dodging resets your bow charge creating a dynamic strategy as you balance defense and offense against your enemies. Bosses are all tightly designed with discernible patterns, allowing you to no damage them with enough practice. In fact, each has a reward available for you if you manage to pull that off. Combat would have enough depth already with just your basic tools alone, but there are some RPG-style equipment mechanics that let you customize your approach even further. If you haven't guessed by this point, the main draw of Mombodora Reverie Under the Moonlight TM is its combat. It has a light Castlevania-esque castle to explore with some neat surprises on how you traverse through it, but overall it is relatively linear due to its smaller size. This is why it is a perfect starter entry. You can enjoy some of the deeper platforming combat available in the genre without being overwhelmed by too large of a world to get lost in. Its smaller length is boasted by the aforementioned no damage challenges and one of the best implementations of difficulty options seen in any game. While this is the fourth entry in the Momodora series, it is technically a prequel, so experience with the previous games is completely unnecessary, although they are fun games. Momodora, Reverie Under the Moonlight TM, is short and sweet and totally worth your time. Monster Boy in the Cursed Kingdom is the spiritual successor to Wonder Boy 3, The Dragon's Trap, where it takes all the best ideas from that game and improves them into an adventure of epic proportions. The titular Monster Boy has fairly simple controls, where you move your weighty knight adjacent to your enemies and swing your short-ranged weapon at them until they're dispatched. Shortly into the story, however, you're turned into a pig and, spoiler alert, you won't be seeing that human form again for a long time. Each animal form you obtain has unique qualities that will either help you against specific enemies in combat or allow you to traverse the world to get to where you need to be. Occasionally, you will even be asked to quickly switch between forms to overcome platforming and puddle challenges, initiating an intense juggling act between your tools. In speaking of tools, the monster forms are not the only discoveries to be made. Different armors, weapons and spells have similarly unique qualities giving you even more fun ways to approach the game. Add in a massive world full of hidden treasure chests and ultra rare equipment and Monster Boy in the Cursed Kingdom will keep you busy for a very long time. If you've played the Metroid series, Axiom Verge will feel immediately familiar to you. 
Enemies are designed more as obstacles in your environment, and the first weapons you obtain also literally act as keys to unlock doors or break down walls. The subtle differences between Axiom Verge and its inspiration start to stack up, however, as you progress. Familiar problems are solved in new ways, like how the ball form is replaced with a remote drone, or how dropping bombs is replaced with a hulking laser drill. Then, you start to run into completely new problems as the world itself starts to glitch out, blurring that line that marks where the fourth wall should be. The Address Disruptor, or the Glitch Gun as some fans like to call it, is what gives Axiom Verge its most unique edge. Enemies can be hacked to change their patterns so you can apply different strategies to them. This mechanic, along with the dozens of weapons you can find, causes the initially straightforward combat to develop into something more dynamic and interesting. The main draw of Axiom Verge, however, is exploring its world and discovering its mysteries. There's a lot more going on with Axiom Verge's story beyond the surface level, and if you're the type that latches on to thoughtful science fiction, that may even be this game's defining feature. Even when the main hero is powerful, in a lot of Metroidvania games, it sort of feels like you're the underdog facing what seem to be impossible odds. But not in Guacamelee Super Turbo Championship Edition. In this game, you play as a luchador superhero, and the combat gameplay is pure beat-em-up action. Enemies can be stunned by your attacks, and you can grapple them and hurl them into each other, which lets you rack on more damage in style. Best of all, you can bring along up to three friends to join in on the action, and you can work together to keep your enemies from ever having a chance to counterattack. To match this direction, the music is upbeat and exciting, so playing the game feels like one long party, or in this case, a fiesta. Now the game starts off with your hero Juan meeting up on a date with the girl of his dreams. But wouldn't you know it, some angry jerk from the underworld has decided to kidnap her and immediately kills him for thinking of stepping in. Luckily, your village has an ancient mask prepared for such an occasion, which brings you back from the dead and bestows further powers as you collect Chuzo statues throughout the world. As you play, you'll gain the power to switch back and forth between the land of the dead and the land of the living. This adds an extra dynamic to the enemies you face and the obstacles you will find. Some of Guacamelee's hardest challenges come from the platforming, where the limits of your dexterity will be tested. As far as Metroidvania design goes, Guacamelee is a little bit linear, but that doesn't stop it from being a hilariously fun romp from start to finish, especially if you bring a friend. And if you end up enjoying the first game, its sequel extends the fiesta with a whole new adventure, one with a new world to explore, new powers to use, and some old and new gimmicks to have fun with. Zoe is back in the land of all of new dungeons to tackle and puzzles to solve. While this game is a sequel to Always Awakening, playing the original isn't necessary to get the most out of it. While Zoe's base abilities may be very similar to your basic Metroidvania, none of the powers fit the usual mold of the double jump or squeezing into tight spaces. Instead, all of your traversal is done using your three magical spells. You can cast a block that can be used as a stepping stone or a puzzle tool, a bubble that gives you vertical lift, or a lightning bolt that hits enemies and objects from a distance, lighting them on fire. You get additional spells and movement upgrades as you progress, but all the game's puzzles are centered around these key abilities. Always Legacy is more of a Zelda-like in the sense that the main objectives take place in dungeon-like areas, but you can tackle the three main dungeons in any order you like, and there are dozens of secrets to be found through exploration. The main exploration rewards are these blue orbs that you can trade for upgrades to your spells. This upgrade tree includes powers that let you explore things even further, like making it so your green block can float on water. You can change how you allocate these orbs anytime you like, so if you see something just out of reach that you know an orb ability can get you to, you can head back to town and pick up what you need. Besides the excellent exploration, Always Legacy's Puzzle Box dungeons are incredibly satisfying to complete, with each one including a unique gimmick that sets it apart. And now for something completely different. It can be argued that Metroidvania is less of a genre as much as it is a level design philosophy. And if there's any game that proves that concept, it's Yoku's Island Express. In this game, you'll be traversing an interconnected world that you can't fully explore until you unlock new powers. The game also includes a hilariously fun fast travel system that gives you a bird's eye view, or should I say, bee's eye view, of everything you've explored so far. But the actual gameplay is pinball. That's right, this is a pinball metroidvania game. 
Instead of equipping weapons or wielding spells and facing off with enemies in hardcore platforming combat, you'll be timing your paddles to hit a fast moving ball. Pinball games are usually about racking up a high score, which Yoku's Island Express retains in the form of collecting fruit. This fruit is the island's currency, and you'll need it to unlock toll gates along the way, meaning the better you perform, the more freedom you have to go where you want. If you're not used to pinball mechanics, don't worry, the consequences for losing a ball aren't very taxing. This makes it one of the more relaxing games overall on this list, which is aided by the pleasant island vacation atmosphere provided by the game's theming. Pinball Metroidvania may seem like a weird idea, but Yoku's Island Express pulls it off in a fun and comforting way. Combining Metroidvania games with mining games seems like an obvious idea, as both genres have a significant focus on exploration. The first SteamWorld Dig game was fairly basic, but with its sequel there are many more directions you can take, with more mines to explore and less linear objectives to complete. The core gameplay loop will have you diving into the mine, collecting gemstones and rare artifacts, and bringing them back to the surface to sell once your inventory is full. The money you get from these gems can be used to buy upgrades, such as increasing your inventory space or making your pickaxe stronger. Along with gems and treasure, you can also find cogs, which slot into a skill tree interface. This allows you to customize your favorite tools with additional effects. Every tool you unlock brings an increased sense of freedom, letting you access new areas to find more treasure. Many tools have added nuances to them, especially in combination with the COG upgrades. So even though you aren't supposed to go to some areas too early, clever application of what you have can let you sequence break the game, and you're almost always rewarded for it, even if it's just to grab a few COGs you would have gotten later otherwise. The world in SteamWorld Dig 2 is incredibly satisfying to break down, making it an easy recommendation. The story isn't too complex, so the first game is by no means a requirement. That concludes the R Metrovania Top 10 Starter Metrovania list. All of these games were presented in no particular order. Did we mention any of your favorites? There were also plenty of games that just barely missed making the list. Comment below with any other games that you would recommend to new Metrovania players. This list was made possible by the R Metrovania subreddit modding team. Phasermint, Emmy, and Master are each part of this all star team. You can chat with them, all of the other voices in this video, and with other Metroidvania fans in the R Metroidvania subreddit Discord, which I will be linking below. The R Metroidvania subreddit is also a fantastic place to learn about upcoming Metroidvania games, chat about game design, or read other Redditor reviews of Metroidvania titles. I highly recommend you check it out. You can hear Kaldroth, Master, and myself, Professor Q, on the weekly R Metroidvania podcast. On the podcast, we discuss various Metroidvania-related game design topics. Once a month, we also have a game night instead of the usual stream, and anyone in the R Metroidvania Discord is invited. At Sero streams regularly, covering obscure games, good and bad. She does get not safe for work sometimes, but if you're looking to check out some relics of the past, then look no further than her channel. Retrogue, also known as Unknown V2, has some excellent YouTube channels, including Retrogvania, where he's covered some hot recent Metroidvania releases and interviewed the developers behind them, and Unknown, where he focuses on gaming for fun. He also streams on a regular basis. Both Atsero and Retrogue love to chat, and are fun to chat with. I highly recommend giving them a follow on Twitch. Sad Shogun and Future Suture can be found regularly chatting on the R Metroidvania Discord, and we thank them again for joining in. This video was edited and compiled by the Metroidvania Review. However, since this was an effort of the entire community, to make sure that you'll always be able to watch it ad-free, we're going to make sure that this video will never be monetized. We would, of course, especially appreciate it if you subscribed and checked out our other videos. We are currently putting out a new video every month, or you can check out our website for a new written Metroidvania Review every Monday. Check out the description below for links to all the websites and channels I've mentioned. On behalf of the entire R Metroidvania team, I sincerely thank you for watching, and I hope you have an especially adventurous day.